Christians. Why do people move? If I gave each a piece of paper and a pen, I'll bet you how many different reasons could we get? You know, would there be a half a dozen easy without repeats? Why do people move? I have a class right now with uh, a couple and their son who are here from India on a one-year visa. It's a work visa. And the wife's um, job skills are so desirable that a, a company here in Omaha brought the family on this 24-hour airplane flight to Omaha. And their son is bilingual. He's uh, nine years old. What a gift. And what a future for him. Why do people move? Um, war? Why do people move? Um, change of government? I'll bet you five cents there's a bunch of people in here who know the story that their ancestors left Europe because of um, government pressure. How about a good one? Why do people move? Love? Know anybody who followed somebody somewhere else? I bet you do. The Book of Acts, too bad it has such a lousy name. Uh, you know the Bible books didn't have names when they were written. They just got names from people who used them. Acts of the Apostles really is the story of people moving. True. Jesus' obedient life and his um, being cursed on the cross and his resurrection, that all took place in a little dinky postage stamp sized in the southeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. You wouldn't even know about it. It's so little and so insignificant. But the book of Acts tells the story that the word moved with people. Now, these people would not have moved unless they had been forced to. Isn't that an interesting thing that the Lord of the world and the Lord of the church can use miserable circumstances to move his word from one place to another and from one person to another. And so Satan is as smart as he is cruel. So he figured out that while the word of Good Friday and Easter was contained in this little spot, this would be his best shot to stamp it out. And so he stamped on it hard, Acts chapter 8. And like a tube of toothpaste, if you can think of a tube of toothpaste, that's the shape of the land of Israel, narrower at the top, wider at the bottom. But if you stamped on a full tube of tooth toothpaste, what would happen? Well, some would shoot out the top and some would shoot out the bottom. That's exactly what happened. And the Christians who fled, who went out the bottom, the, this book does not follow their story. They have a story, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get it all uh, evening by evening in heaven someday. But this book has a different purpose, and it was to say... If the word of Good Friday and Easter could get from little dinky, tiny Israel up around the top of the Mediterranean Sea, if, despite all the obstacles Satan threw in its way and all the, all the terrorizing that he did, I wonder if it could make it all the way to Rome. Rome was the center, the beating heart of the empire. And if something could get to Rome, it could go anywhere. Because the Roman army had hard rules and hard roads to travel. And they went to Africa, they went to the Middle East, they went to Spain, they went to Germany, they went to England and Scotland. What would happen if the word could travel from dinky little Israel, it's only 12 miles wide at its narrowest spot. Who drove more than 12 miles today? That's how little Israel is. 
And so the book of Acts is that story. It's very interesting, very interesting. One episode after another, and never a sure thing. You know, we're sort of lazy intellectually. We're sort of lazy students because we say, oh, you know, um, I've been a Christian my whole life. You know, to me, Easter, Good Friday and Easter, that's like warm yogurt that you left in the car for a couple days and forgot about. It, do it doesn't have any, anything in it to change a life. It's just what I do twice a month or three times a month. We kind of think God is provincial and that he's limited to a certain spot. So when we leave here, you know, we can just do, go do our own thing. And the really important thing is family. You know, what a lie of the devil. You're doing the most important thing right now that you do all week long, which is worship. That is our work. Well, here's the back story. I don't think you can understand the little scrap we read here um, in the way the Holy Spirit wants you to understand that unless you sort of see what's happening here. So Christians were driven under duress out of Israel. Men, women, boys, girls, teens. And this jumps in at one spot where they came to a city and they had a couple of weeks of, it was a little, what do I mean, call it a team because that sounds too organized. It, it was a, a little ragged band of believers. Paul, his co-worker Silas, a young man they were mentoring named Timothy, and our buddy, the medical doctor who wrote the good news according to Luke. They are in a city and they had a couple of weeks where they, they had a landing place. There was a synagogue where they could go meet with people who knew the story of God creating the world and of Abraham and Sarah and of David and the prophets and the promises of the Savior. So they had a couple good weeks, but then Contrary to the warm yogurt theory of the Bible, of the written word, a, a riot, a, a riot broke out because they were teaching Good Friday. God's son damned so you would never be in Easter. The preposterous, spectacular, undreamed of impossible, a dead person living again. A riot broke out, and this just shows us what we already know to be true, that Satan always hits back. I mean, Martin Luther said, where Christ is preached, Satan is not far. If you want Satan to leave you alone, just quit coming to church. That's the easiest way to get him out of your life. Just, just quit coming to church. Quit reading meditations. Quit teaching your children. Satan will leave you alone. Here he swings back with a vengeance. A riot, can you imagine? And they, they had to flee the city. They went down the road who knows how many miles. You can read it for yourself, Acts 17. They stop in another city. They try to uh, set up a little um, calendar where they can meet with some people. They have a little bit of success, and then it happens again. People from the last town hear what is being taught, that this crucified Jew from little Israel is the great God and they came after him again, and this time the team said, okay, um, what can we do? It's one thing if God wants our little experiment to end here, but we don't know that for sure. So they split up. And three of them stayed. Maybe if there was gonna be legal action or police action, they stayed to take it. But some of the members of the congregation took Paul by night to the coast, and they booked him passage on a ship that sailed south 
down the coast so that he would be lost in the sea of citizens of Athens. Oh, man, Athens, a million people at this time. That was a big, big city. Athens was a place as well as a mindset. The Athenians were very brilliant people. They were an empire, so they knew how to fight. They were really good at fighting. They would roll over another country and, and build their empire. They were wonderful sailors. That's how they started out to get so strong. Wonderful seamen. They would, there was always another island out there on the wine dark sea, and they would sail to it and set up a trading post and move on. You've seen posters in the travel agency of Athens, you know? Rising out of the downtown is a great big promontory or rock, the Acropolis, the Acropolis, the high city. And on top of that, what's been called the most beautiful building in the world, the Parthenon. In Greek, Parthenos is a virgin. They had a thousand virgins there to help you with your worship. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols, I-D-O-L. An idol is a counterfeit god. It's a substitute for the real McCoy. And in Athens, with all that, you know, come on. Everybody knows this about Athens. We get the theater from Athens. Who doesn't like to go to a play? Democracy, architecture, our most beautiful buildings in Washington are Greek. So Athens, racial prejudice big time, because we are the people. We are the people. I, I know that you have had to read Greek mythology. That's not our goal here this morning to show you how much we can all remember about Greek mythology, but here is a thing to help you understand what the Holy Spirit is showing us this morning about Easter. We who have the warm yogurt temptation. We roll into church once a month and think we've done our duty. It's a very different thing happening here. When you are baptized into Christ, you are fitted with an explosive vest, like a terrorist. And you got two wires. One is Good Friday and one is Easter. You can't really talk about Easter, can you, without talking about Good Friday? You can't. What sense would it make? You just wind up celebrating Easter bunnies and eating peeps. But if you want to know what Easter's about, you got to no good Friday. And dead is dead, and nobody comes back, and you know it. Well, the Greeks knew it. But they had this mindset, and, and you know all the fabulous plays, they love talking about life and death and what comes after. They had all these gods, each one provincial, each one only governing one aspect of life. So I'll just give you a couple quick ones, and pardon me for either too much or too little here. See if you remember some of this stuff. If you were a soldier, you had to parley with the god of war, because death is just a step away. So you would go to his temple, and you would pay you would listen to the priest, you would light some incense, buy a candle, maybe a wristband or a, or a necklace to wear as you fought. You had to parley with, his Roman name is Mars, you remember that, that we get our word Marshall, M-A-R-T-I-A-L. If you're a young mom and you want to start a family, you got to deal with the goddess of fertility, and she is no one to mess around with. The goddess. You know that she appears in every culture, Mother Earth, you get that. You go to her altar, you go to her temple, you light a candle, you pay some money, you say some prayers, you buy a little trinket or a shrine, you take it home, you pray every day, light a little candle, say your prayers to the goddess of fertility. She's going to show up here in a couple chapters, big time. 
One more. If you're a sailor and you go out on the sea, you got to deal with the Earth Shaker, capital E. Who's the Earth Shaker? Who remembers? Poseidon. He rides around under the sea in his chariot pulled by giant seahorses. And he will find you. If you set foot in the water, he will find you. If you have not made your peace, if you have not bartered uh, in accord with Poseidon, um, that's, that's going to be the worst decision you ever made. So they have all these gods. And in Athens, this beautiful, cultured, impressive city. Downtown is just full of temples and churches and avenues and groves and pillars. And it says, while Paul was waiting, he was greatly distressed. In Greek, it says paroxysm. We don't use that word, but you probably know what that means. A paroxysm is like a seizure almost. Greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So what's he going to do? Go back to his motel room and scroll through his messages? No, he walked around. And he learned about the people he was among. See, he was a different race. He had a different skin color. He had a different language. Very unlike our American individuality, where if somebody disagrees with you, you know, you cancel them. Or worse, you murder them on social media. But Paul said, God put me here. And I'm killing time. The waiting is the hardest part. Who said that? And, and he, he went through the city, and he read, and he learned, and he listened to these people, and he got an opportunity. Imagine that. I see that in every way you're very religious, he said. Sometimes I hear our dear Christian people use the word religion, like they'll say, well, I'm, re I'm, I'm religious. That isn't the same thing as being a Christian. You know that, right? There's a hundred religions in the world, but there's only one Christianity. Ninety-nine of them are bust your tail to show God you're worth saving. One of them is God came down from heaven down here and stood between you and the wolf. He's the good shepherd because he lets the wolf bite him, and you go free. And then you spend the rest of your life thinking about that in every episode of your life. So Christians are fitted out with this explosive vest by virtue of their baptism. Everybody's got it, not just people who are, quote, on fire for the Lord. Everybody's got it. He says, men of Athens, I see that in every way. You're very religious, for as I walked around your city and I've, I observed your objects of worship. Oh, that's so wearying, isn't it? That we have to spend time on other people and other people break into our schedules. Oh, it's so painful. People want my time. I need me time. I need time for myself. What would happen if I actually listened to somebody more than once. You know, when Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross, did you ever think of this, that your cross is your neighbor? A lot of people say, it's me and God, me and God. I got my own thing going. I'm spiritual. It's me and God. Do you know what? That's an ancient heresy. That's called mysticism. It's weird. That is not why God put you on earth, so that you could self-actualize. Why don't you become a monk or a nun if you want to do that? That's the most beautiful flowering of that teaching, that just God and me, I live in pure spirituality. God plunked you down among people on purpose. You're here for somebody else's sake. Did you ever think of that? And they're here because of you. As I walked around and observed your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. In Greek, it's two words. One is agnostic. Agnostic is not atheist. Atheist is there is no God. In my whole life, I just, I've met very few atheists. And the ones I have met or listened to, I thought they were working pretty hard um, to... to, to to hold on to that position. 
Agnostic, on the other hand, that just means we don't know. And, and agnostics are everywhere. You may have some at work. You may have some in your house. It's being a skeptic, and we think that's noble. To the unknown God. If Paul hadn't been paying attention, if he hadn't walked around, if he hadn't listened to learn a little bit about these people he was living among, he'd never have seen that. To an unknown God. What were they scared of? A ah, little bit of the fear of God there. What if we missed with all our gods and all our temples, all our pillars, all our altars, all our chapels, all our groves uh, dedicated to this goddess or that? What if we missed one? What if there's some provincial god who is going to mess with the Athenian polis? P-O-L-I-S is what they call themselves. Paul says, what you worship is something unknown I'm going to proclaim to you. Do you see what's going on here? God shipped his child to a land without Easter. Some of you remember maybe reading this fairy tale, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Did you read that when you were a teenager? Where it's always winter and never Christmas because a witch cast a spell over the land. It's always winter and never Christmas. That's not this. These guys lived in the land without Easter. The Greek people believe that we live in something called the house of death. Just think of the biggest resort you've ever seen or been to, and everybody's in there. And you're born in the house of death, you grow in the house of death, you learn in the house of death, you acquire property in the house of death, you fall in love in the house of death, and then you die in the house of death. You don't get out. Now, that's the Athenian mind. And their gods were lustful like human beings. They were vengeful like human beings. This is your world. Agnosto theo. To the unknown God. And Paul says, well, you listen. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. All your gods are under the big one. And he is a crucified carpenter from Nazareth in Israel. You didn't know this? You're so smart? The vaunted Greeks? You need to change your mind. You need to repent. This is ignorance, he said. They said, you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. Everybody who visits Gethsemane should say the same thing. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. A dead person living again? You? That after you die, Jesus says, if I live, you also will live? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. And then he says, from one man he made every nation of men. You see what he's doing there? That's his race prejudice thing. As if, as if there is some kind of pure stock in the world. What a sinful, devilish teaching. I hope you see that for what it is. It's adolescence. From one man, our DNA all goes back to Adam and Eve. We all are the same color of blood under the skin. And we all are as ignorant. We're all fools and sinners like the Athenians. But somebody told you. Don't ever forget it. Somebody told you. And so when we say, I can't stand the fools and the sinners in my own life, I'm going to cancel them. Just remember that this idea that it's you and God that's baloney. It's worse than that. It's not biblical. It's satanic. Unless your neighbor is in the picture, you don't even know who you are. God put you in this world on behalf of your neighbor. And so Paul, alert to opportunities, touches the two wires of that explosive vest and talks to them about Jesus and the resurrection. And then he says the most astounding thing 
You could talk about this all summer. We could have a sermon series on it all summer. He says, God determined the exact times you would live and the exact places you would live. Do you even believe that? You think that you live where you do, and as you think back over your life, doors opened, opportunities came up, hopes died, and you made a decision and you moved. But one day you're going to see that the whole time the Lord of the church was behind you, nudging you this way and nudging you this way, and that's finally what Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 means, by grace are we saved through faith, is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's already designed. So this coming week for you is going to be one opportunity after another unrolling before you, unbeknownst to you many times, where you will have an influence on people it's just what Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth by virtue of your, as Luther says, being baked into a cake with me. Your baptism, you're baked into a cake with Jesus. By virtue of your contact with me, I have made you salty and I shake you out among people. And this is not really about you, if you understand what the scripture is saying. It's not... It's not really about you, it's about your neighbor. So here's Paul. God shipped his child to a land without Easter. Very religious, empty of Jesus. And then Paul watched for an opportunity. Would it come? He listened, he walked, he read, he learned. Dare we say... He understood who he was. And then when the opportunity came, kaboom. God ships his child to a land without Easter. That's you. That's you. Isn't it dignifying? It's not all about me. Jesus didn't say, you might be salt one day if you get your act together. He said, you are salt because you have been baptized into my name. And every person you interact with is affected as salt on a chicken breast or salt on a icy sidewalk, or salt on the fender of my car. Salt has an influence. Jesus says, bank on it. And here is the story, if you can handle this, of how you know about Good Friday and Easter. Because the word moved with people under pressure, and it did move despite many heartaches, heartbreaks, fearful episodes, it did make it to Rome and it did make it to Nebraska and somebody told you, don't ever forget it. When you want to be alone with God, just remember that you heard it here. That's sick. Your neighbor is in the picture. God doesn't need anything from you. If you want to read this for yourself when you get home, did you hear Paul say it? God doesn't need anything from you. Nothing. What are you going to give him? Martin Luther said, should I give God a bale of hay so he can sit down? What do you have that God wants? But your neighbor needs everything from you. So if we want to worship God or serve God, we don't say, oh, I live in this pure spirituality. I have this thing going with God. God goes, absolutely not. I plunk you down among people. Your neighbor needs everything from you. Christians, God ships his child to a land without Easter. Very religious, but no Jesus. But this one shows us, watch, listen, learn, observe. And when you get your shot, 
The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Kaboom. Amen.